You're listening to the Eldest Jiry Channel. <laughs> Chapter 4 Mausoleum Neither the professor nor the abbot slept much that night, and both met up rather late during breakfast. Abbot Gregory spoke first. Did you eventually get off to sleep, only to awaken, thinking last night's revelation was a dream, professor? I do wish it was only that, but I'm rather concerned, to say the least, as to what we will find in the mausoleum. I meant to ask you about this underground river. Have you seen it? Not seen it, just heard of it from that book. There's nothing about a secret chamber or a river entrance I know of near the crypt, but I suppose it may well have been walled up after the death of the monks. Certainly worth investigating. After we've looked in the mausoleum. Not looking forward to that one, but we must try to find Brother Edward. I'm guessing he might be in there. Shall we start at ten? Yes, if I can summon up the courage, the professor winced. I'll sort out the torches, and we'll just have to see how far we get. We'll do this without the others being involved. Certainly, replied the professor, just in case things go horribly wrong. The Oros Mountain seemed more menacing than usual as it towered protectively over the cemetery building. On this dull day they arrived at the mausoleum doors. So there are no keys to those padlocks? They're rust-welded, anyway. We'll have to force them open. Did you pack the crowbar? I have it here. Shall we take turns? said the abbot, with a wry smile. Okay, you start at your mausoleum cracked the professor. The emergence of humor at this point momentarily took their mind off the task, but neither could guess what lay ahead. Groaning, creaking, flaking iron finally gave way to the prying crowbar as the hasps ruptured, but the ancient robust doors remained firmly wedged shut after centuries of damp and decay. The professor took up the crowbar and thrust its nail-pulling end into the crumbling wood beneath one of the door hinges, until they finally succumbed to the determined efforts, and the door was able to be heaved open enough for them to squeeze through. Sheets of dusty cobwebs drifted menacingly down over their heads as they fought their way through to stand inside the structure at last. As their eyes accommodated to the dingy, dusty dimness, rows of gothic arches could be seen stretching either side the length of the building. Between the rows ran an enclosing balustrade separating the ground floor from a wide stone stairway descending into ominous blackness. We'll shine both torches into each of the arched recesses if we're going to do this methodically, the professor decided. Each alcove contained a burial basket, some of wood and others of stone, positioned against the far wall. Centuries of dust and debris strewn across the floor revealed small animal skeletons of rats, bats, and birds, their small dismantled bodies laid to rest in a place built for the purpose. Well, that's the first row checked. No brother Edward here, stated the professor unreverentially. Now for the other side. Abbot Gregory found himself following the rather more eager professor on his quest to reveal the secrets of the mausoleum. Having thoroughly checked the ground-floor alcoves, they each shone their torch down the deep stone stairway. "'After you, Abbot,' he joked, more in fear than humor. It was no easy manner negotiating each step, as each was littered with the same debris as everywhere else.' and had to be kicked aside to secure sure footing before the next step. Torchlight lit the stairway walls and the immediate steps, but could not show what lay below. Finally, the last step revealed itself as they hit level ground. It seems to be just a repeat of upstairs, remarked the professor. More archways and more alcoves. He spotted a large, iron-banded wooden chest positioned at the side of the casket in one of the alcoves, but that would have to wait until another day. 
The heavy, fusty air was difficult to breathe as they continued their careful search for evidence of Brother Edward, in fact, for evidence of any of the vanished monks. The building was evidently just on two levels, as expected, but they hadn't seen the well which was reportedly incorporated within the lower level. Shining his torch around one last time, the professor noticed a flagstone partially misplaced in the floor, as if someone had tried to lift it and not replaced it properly. Hmm, perhaps that's the well, the professor whispered. Why are you whispering, commented the abbot in another fear-induced episode of humor. The crowbar was again put to work to move the slab aside. Inch by inch, the ever-increasing gap allowed an evil stench to pervade their nostrils, and then they heard a sound, the sound of rushing water. The abbot caught his breath to speak. That's the river, then, and something's rotting down there. They both gave each other a prolonged stony stare, fearing the worst. Once removed, the slab revealed narrow stone steps inviting the pair to investigate the unknown depths of the mausoleum. You're going first this time, Professor. I knew you were going to say that. Wedging the crowbar over the corner of the opening provided a handhold as the Professor carefully lowered himself down, all the time fighting against retching. They couldn't stay in this place for long. At the bottom of twelve stone steps, the professor's torch light opened a good-sized stone room hewn into the limestone with an arched exit to a river tunnel on the far side opposite the steps' entrance arch. Investigation of the remaining four sides of the hexagonal chamber revealed concave, backward-sloping, arch-topped, alcoved walls set at an angle of about seventy degrees to the hexagonal floor, and the floor itself incorporating a carved round basin about fifteen feet across with a raised aperture in the middle, above their heads a central opening in the vaulted roof. "'What's this all about?' exclaimed the professor in surprise. "'There are triangular markings, engravings in the center of each of the alcove walls.' Come and see what you think. Each curved alcove wall had a large, deeply inscribed, inverted pentagram upon it, with the two pairs of alcoves opposite one another. Turning his torch towards the professor, the abbot illuminated the entrance to the river tunnel, revealing the eyeless, rotting, mutilated corpse of Brother Edward. I'm getting out of here! The abbot shouted and clambered the stone-cold steps on his hands and knees in his haste, with the professor right behind him. The crowbar dislodged, ringing and clattering its way down the stone steps to the chamber floor below, audibly adding to the fearful tension and anxiety felt by the intrepid explorers. The pair explosively dislodged the debris cluttering the floors and steps, as they made their way up to the shaft of the light at the place where they had entered the mausoleum more than two hours earlier. It was impossible for them to keep secret what they had found as they returned to the abbey through the kitchen garden, alarming the brothers preparing the midday meal. Panic was written all over their faces, and questions flowed fast and furious as to what had happened to Brother Edward. The Abbey residents were in shock as gradually, over the next few hours, their story was told about the discovery of their fellow brother. But it was decided on the way back not to mention the pentagram symbols in the weird hexagonal stone chamber. There was already enough bad news to take in. The professor decided that his evening would be best spent trying to relax in his room listening to music on the Pi radio provided in the corner of his room. He had to unwind to clear his mind enough to plan what he should do next. He was about to retire to bed when there was a soft knock on his door. "'Hello? Who's there?' he called. There was no reply, so he partially opened the door and was surprised to see the monk who had welcomed him on his arrival. "'I didn't call out. Uh, it was me for fear of being caught. Caught for what? What have you done? 
I need to speak with you now that I know what happened to Brother Edward. You see, your life's in danger. Now you've discovered the Halloween chamber, and so will mine be if I'm caught speaking to you. Go on. Another of the brothers, Brother Thomas, is troubled and confided in me. He told me that satanic forces are being summoned to exact revenge on the people of Grimsfell and the Abbey, and that he was chosen to do the work Brother Edward had refused to undertake, and that's why they killed him. Who is they? I'm sorry, what is your name? Brother Dawson. I came here ten years ago. Can you arrange for me to meet Brother Thomas, perhaps in the grounds, this evening? He doesn't know I'm telling you, and he's the one who's being prepared to kill you. Who or what is preparing him to kill me? The miasma from the river tunnel. Brother Thomas told me the river runs underground from the mountain, under the mausoleum, and then under the abbey and out to the sea, under water. Another passage leads up into a cave inside the cliffs. The one they say was used by a witch's coven. The miasma is produced in the Halloween chamber by the three immortal ravens and a crow. They fly into the witch's cave and up along the river tunnel to the chamber where they transform back into the Bennet siblings' human form. Their satanic rituals bring forth the demon who disintegrates into the evil, mind-altering miasma in such quantity that the vapor fills the river tunnel and then flows downhill above the water to beneath the abbey and insidiously pervades the building. It is capable of turning the minds of susceptible people to do the will of its creator, the demon summoned by the Bennets in retribution for Grimsfell folk forcing them to exist as corvids evermore. On one day a year, All Hallows' Eve, October the 31st, when the membrane between the good overworld and the evil underworld is at its most fragile, the power of evil can break through and wreak havoc on the living. The Halloween chamber acts as a portal between these two worlds. If this is true, why are you risking your life telling me? Because Brother Edward was my dear friend. I had to watch him succumb to the evil power of the miasma. Brother Thomas and both Brother Edward and I are carrying susceptible people and I may be the next in line to suffer from its evil influence. It is now November, but the miasma is so clinging that it remains beneath the abbey for many weeks, continually permeating the building. But how was Brother Edward killed? Brother Thomas didn't say. That's when I decided to tell you about it. You may be able to find a way, perhaps through science. He cannot prevent attempting to kill you because you are a threat to the determined intentions of the Bennets to cause suffering to all here in Grimsfeld for what happened nearly four centuries ago. Long after Brother Dawson left, the professor endured a restless night, his mind awashed with trying to decide what to do and if he really was in danger from this deranged monk. The next day, two police cars and a van arrived outside the abbey gates, responding to the abbot's report that a body had been found. Officers gathered the monks into small groups to get a general idea of circumstances leading up to Brother Edward's disappearance. Meanwhile, the mausoleum doors were being wrenched open wide to remove the body from the subterranean chamber. The question arose as to how the body came to be where it was found, because the only open access to the chamber at the time was by the river tunnel. Policemen and waiters passed down the stone steps of the Halloween chamber and on through the opening into the tunnel. Although fast-flowing, it was shallow and rocky and perfectly possible to navigate. One hundred yards downstream they found themselves next to a ledge with stone steps leading up into the depths of the abbey foundations next to the crypt and into an elaborately carved large room set out with a central black granite altar with satanic inscriptions over the cobweb festooned walls and ceiling. It was difficult to see, despite their torches, 
but eventually the team of investigators discovered a sealed-up entranceway at the opposite end of the chamber to the river tunnel entrance that was found to lead directly into the abbey crypt, the way Brother Edward was taken. The doctor, who had examined the body before its removal, walked over from his car towards the abbot. He was in a right old mess, I can tell you. Not much of his face left. I gather you saw that when you found him in that hell hole. To tell you the truth, I didn't stay to look. Do you know how he died? I do, but you're not going to believe it, said the doctor with a fixed, intent stare. He was pecked to death. We found black feathers that must have dislodged during the attack. The abbot recoiled in horror, his mind still fresh, with the images of ravens and crows from the recent revelations. He quickly composed himself, not wanting to reveal the relevant content of the supernatural stories of Corvids. He had to think quickly. Perhaps it was the abbey's raven territory, and they attacked him to protect it, he concluded. Do you have many ravens at the abbey? asked the doctor. I've seen a few flying around the roof, he hastily added. Well, it's most unusual. I've heard of seagulls attacking for a few chips, but not murderous subterranean ravens. The whole day was taken up with police activity, and the crypt's hidden entrance slab was replaced after photographs of the satanic room were taken. It was a welcome peace that settled on Grimsfell Abbey that evening as the professor decided to take the evening air. The following day, one of the brothers passed on a message to the professor that had been received from the landlord of the witch's brew, asking him to come down to the village because he had some more information for him. It was a fine but chilly walk down to the village pub. I'm glad you could call, said the landlord. I hadn't told you my name. It's George Morgan, he revealed. I'll have some of that fine witch's brew of yours then, George, and have one yourself. There's things I hadn't told you about the missing children, he began. Every so often, over the years, children disappear and are never found. They're always descendants of the ancient village people, never newcomers' children. What the police... What do they make of it, then, George? They're as puzzled as we are that it always occurs at Christmas time. We've come to call them the Christmas children. It's all very sad. Of course, some folk here think it's all to do with Alice, seeking revenge from the past. I wondered whether you'd find it a useful addition to your investigation. When did the last child vanish from the village, George? Nearly three years ago, a seven-year-old girl named Florence Fleming was last seen feeding a neighbor's chickens on a December morning in 1950. The devastated parents, the police, and the villagers' searches came to nothing. It went on for weeks. His words started to crack, and he gave a cough. I'm so sorry to hear this. We must get to the truth of this grisly mystery. Can it possibly be true that ancient, deranged monks and a witch are responsible? Common sense tells me it can't be, but something strange is going on which would be described as paranormal. And it's that time of year again. 